Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's Local to Global workshop featuring the return of Mr. James Rosebush to the Council. A part of the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston, Local to Global engages early career professionals in peer-driven learning and dialogue on leading international affairs issues, as well as workshops and valued lessons in today's ever-changing world. Before we dive in, I'd like to provide a couple of points of information. Starting this week, every Friday at noon, we will be hosting Global Connections, where we will bring you short lunchtime conversations with the local uh, professionals who make an impact to our community and the global, uh, the, the global world as it is. Tomorrow, our first program will be hosting uh, Dean of the Consular Corps of Houston, Consul General of Argentina, Mr. Gabriel Volpi. And next week, we will host Jake Sullivan, former National Security Advisor to President Joe, uh, Vice President Joe Biden. This members only event is available to current members. So if you haven't already, join us today at WAC Houston, excuse me, WACHouston.org or call us at 713-522-7811 and we'll be happy to help enroll you in a membership so you can watch next week's program as well as more member exclusive events with the World Affairs Council throughout the year. Now today's program will consist of Mr. Rosebush's presentation, followed by a brief Q&A session. While we love to see and have all our attendees present, we do ask that you please remain muted throughout the program. Be sure to submit any questions you have via the chat box, and then we will provide them to Mr. Rosebush and relay, relay, that, to him, relay that to him during the Q&A session. Also, in the coming days, be on the lookout for an email as we will send all registrants a link to a recording of this program, which can be found along with our other past programs on the Council's YouTube channel. Now, on to our speaker for today. Mr. James Rosebush is an internationally renowned corporate strategist, industry-leading executive coach, former White House official, and best-selling author. For over 20 years, he has been the CEO of the top international consulting firm, Growth Strategy Inc., where he has helped over 450 international companies at various stages achieve valued growth, as well as provide family, uh, provide family offices advice on asset management, investment, and philanthropic strategies. As head of the Impact, uh, as the head of ImpactSpeakerCoach.com, armed with training by Dale Carnegie and with years as an integral part of the Great Communicators Administration. James Rosebush coaches individuals, coaches, and executives at every level on public speaking and delivering their messages with confidence. As many in the council are familiar, Mr. Rosebush notably served in the Reagan administration as deputy assistant to, the, to President Ronald Reagan, as well as chief of staff to First Lady Nancy Reagan. He returns to the council where he last spoke in 2017 on his best-selling book, True Reagan, What Made Ronald Reagan Great and Why It Mattered. He joins us today with his latest book, another number one bestseller on Amazon, Winning Your Audience, Deliver a Message with Confidence of a President. Mix in with illustrious stories of his international travels from meeting the Politburo uh, to watching President Reagan firsthand give his iconic speech at the Brandenburg Gate James's book provides us with a comprehensive guide to every facet important in becoming an effective public speaker. He joins us today to provide a power-up masterclass on public speaking just for the council. Mr. James Broswish, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate that very concise and articulate introduction. I'm very happy to be back in Houston with all of you. And I'd love it if some of you would turn on your video screen so I can see you, even if you're in sweats or you're walking around, love to have that. But I'm also used to speaking to audiences these days where I can't see anyone, but it's just terrific to be back in Houston, one of my very favorite places. And uh, also happy to be sharing with you some ideas about effective public speaking, because this is not a subject that's reserved for presidents and prime ministers. It is also critically important for all of us who are salespeople or teachers or parents that we learn how to communicate with other people. And as I always say, it's something that if you have the skill for it, it can make or break a contract, an employment offer, or a, a, you know, or a wedding invitation as well, right? So uh, it, you have a lot at stake when it comes to being able to communicate 
with other people. And I think the stakes are even increasing higher. So you see a lot of CEOs today losing their jobs because they've lost equity value for their companies because they can't communicate. Or uh, as is in the case with Elon Musk, uh, leading Tesla, he's made some critical errors. Well, perhaps he was smoking some things that he shouldn't have, and he put some things on Twitter that the SEC didn't like. So people at all levels have to acquire skills in order to, to just get by in life, to have basic relationships, and also to be successful in our careers. So what I'm going to offer you today is an accelerated power-up masterclass. I'm going to cover 14 points. Probably in my book, which you've, you've seen, and I hope you all have a copy of or will get this, but uh, there are probably 300 points in there. This book is written as a handbook so that you can actually use and tear out pages and make notes and all that sort of thing so that you can really use it to not acquire, not just acquire public speaking skills, but to actually deploy them in your everyday life. So we're gonna cover a little bit of this. And at first I wanna start off by telling you how I came about this whole fascination with and commitment to learning how to speak more effectively. So in my first job, uh, really before I finished college, I was working for a family office and foundation, the founder of General Motors. And the third week I was there, I was sitting at my desk and I heard automatic machine gun fire uh, going through the front door, the big glass front door of the office, smashed the door, all of us dove under our desk, grabbed our, phone, grabbed our phones, and wondered whether we were going to be alive in five minutes or not. So what, what had happened was that six ski mask gunmen attacked our office, uh, attempting to take us as hostage, but we weren't really the value play here. It was the son of the wealth creator, the son of the founder of General Motors, but well, he was thrown in a room size safe and that room was locked. So he was kept out of harm's way. And after five hours, the SWAT team led us down the back staircase, down the fire escape of the building. And we were uh, unharmed as well. So about, uh, I, I don't know, a few weeks after that, this gentleman who had been locked in, in, the, in the safe came to me and he said, I'd like you to start a strategic initiative among our trustees and our staff to answer this question. Are we having impact by what we're doing in our investment strategy and in our philanthropy? Are we really reaching the targets that we, we've set for ourselves and how can we do a better job of that? Well, this is, a, this is a tall order for someone who had just started. I was really in my second professional job, but I relished it, I dug into it and we had a great time with it. Little did I know that 10 years after that, I would be invited into the White House to start the same kind of initiative, President Reagan's Impact Investing and Impact Philanthropy Initiative, which was a thrilling opportunity. But to go back to this first, what happened as a result of this, this man changed, this, this incident changed his life. He had, he had been a sort of a person who was just managing his wealth, which was fine. But this experience with this touch with terror had a massive impact on his own life and his own personality and his own values and commitment. And it brought him to life to address this. And, and for the rest of his life, he was really focused on and supportive of impact investing and impact philanthropy. So that was a tremendous thing for me to observe. At the same time, a few weeks after that, I went to the, what we call the Soviet Union at that time. Very few Americans were going there. I was selected as a Rotary International Scholar. And I was asked to meet with one-on-one -on -one with the heads of Politburo agencies. So you say public housing, public transportation, so forth. These were uh, all men who were, I, I say, three times my age and four times my girth. So you can imagine meeting with these Soviet, these communist leaders of these different Politburo agencies, which is a fascinating experience. At the same time, I was trailed by intelligence officers who assumed that I was a spy. So. Uh, when I got back to the, the U.S. after two months, I knew that part of my uh, fellowship, the Rotary International Fellowship, was that I had to give speeches to Rotary clubs everywhere. And I thought to myself, hmm, now I had been brought up by a dad who happened to be a teacher of Dale Carnegie, which you're probably all familiar with. So I had the fundamentals of how to make a great and impactful speech but I'd never been put in a position to have to do it other than making speeches at my college or my high school. 
So now I knew something that was the most important. I had uh, something that I could communicate with and a strategy I could use, and that was I could tell stories. So as I always say, the main thing that people want to hear is stories. They want to hear stories about you. They want to hear stories about anything that you've read. They want to be told metaphors. They want to be, they, they want you to share with them something from your old, own life story. And we'll talk about this in a minute. So this was really the beginning of my seeing how important public speaking really is. So I had to go out and speak. My, at the first one, my dad was in the audience. So I thought, hmm, I'm going to be severely judged by him, I'm sure. But using the stories from my experience, both that from that day of being taken hostage at my first job by those six ski mask gunmen and my experience in, this, in the Soviet Union as being thought of as a spy and being tailed by intelligence officers and warranting, I'm sure, some kind of a dossier at their intelligence agency was adequate enough for me to be able to tell these stories. Now, some of you are going to say, well, that's easy for you, Jim, because you, you had these interesting experiences to talk about. And while that is true, I'm going to share with you today how anyone can become a great storyteller. So here we go. There's seven points in two sections. If you want to take notes and if you want to form any questions that you might have of me, I'm going to go as fast as I can through this so that we can get to your questions and I can answer them. So the first thing I want you to know a little bit about is number one is the historic origin of storytelling. The first section here is storytelling. The second is building a bridge to your audience. These are two, I chose two of the most critical aspects of public speaking to share with you today. Uh, there are many things that we could talk about, but again, storytelling and building a bridge to your audience are among the most important. So where did storytelling and why come from and why is it so critical? So of course, storytelling, if you go back to uh, tribal lives before there was anything printed or there was any other kind of communication device, it was all done through storytelling and parables. So you find that in early tribal cultures, they had to pass family history on through telling stories. So these stories were told from generation to generation, and they were passed on, and that became history. Now, when the Mediterranean area uh, and, and the what we now know as, as Greece, the first ancient democracy was beginning to form all of these uh, islands in the Aegean, Aegean came together to form a defensive barrier against intruding nations, and that gave them the impetus to create this early form of democracy. They began to see that in order to have a sustained democratic way of life, they had to be able to speak. They had to have oratory. They had to be able to declare these principles on which these pillars, just like the pillars they used in architecture of democracy, had to be defended and they had to be articulated. And this is where the beginning of rhetoric started. So you have the rules of rhetoric. You have uh, the first speech coaches. You have people who are really learning both in the Greek and Roman Empire, where there weren't any lawyers to plead your case in court, by the way. You had to go yourself and you had to be articulate enough to win your case. And you couldn't employ anyone else to do it for you. So these were sort of the, the roots of how rhetoric, training on how to speak, and the dependency upon uh, our, an articulate uh, populace were so critical to survival. I think this is just the same today. Our democracy is critical. It's critical to our democracy to have and be able to have the ability to articulate its value in our own lives. And this is what the, the ancient Greeks saw, is what I think we, we have to have today. And only, for example, in business schools and MBA programs, only 24% of all MBA programs require public speaking, and yet they may require accounting. I think that learning how to speak in public is critically more important than learning accounting. And I think in today's marketplace, you see that uh, accelerated. Second point. Today, what we have in speaking is we have what in storytelling is journalistic style of speaking. So if you look at today's Wall Street Journal or your local newspaper or any paper that you read, New York Times, whatever, you'll see that every single 
uh, story begins with, uh, every, every single um, article begins with a story. So if they want to talk about the hurricane or what, what might have happened in Houston but didn't, they will always say, they'll say, uh, well, it, you know, they, uh, they'll name a family and they'll say, uh, they opened their front door to see that there was debris all over the front lawn, but that they were safe. So they're referring to a specific person. So journalistic style of reporting is what's popular today. And journalistic style of speaking is equally as important. So you see the way I started our little conversation today was to tell you this story. And why did I do that? I did it to illustrate some points and to also share something about me, open myself up to the audience. So journalistic styles of uh, speaking is what, what we have today and what we, the way we do it. So if you, as an example, if you notice on the evening news, if you've ever watched David Muir, who has the highest ratings as a news reader of uh, the evening news, network news, you will see that he is uses what I call accelerated delivery. So he was the first one who came on and within the 22 minutes that he's allowed uh, to tell stories, he speaks at a very fast clip. Now, why does he do that and does it really work? Well, first of all, if you're speaking rapidly, generally, your audience is gonna feel that you're more, the speaker is more intelligent and they have more vital information that you had to hang on to. So what, what I call this, is not only rapid delivery, but hang on. The audience has to hang on because the audience wants to get what you're saying. They want to remember it. They want to take notes from it. And the faster you're going, then the more the audience is going to want to stay attentive to what you're offering. So David Muir was really the first newsreader to, to use this tactic. And it won him a high praise and high ratings as well. So to be able to pack your uh, those 22 minutes as he does with fast reporting and stories at a fast clip keeps your audience going along. Uh, I think that also you have examples uh, when Reagan went to the Brandenburg Gate, for example, and he says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. He's speaking at a fast clip, but notice that he tells Gorbachev where he wants the wall to go. Where did he want the wall to go? He wanted to go down. So he uses proper emphasis, which is another part of journalistic speaking. You need to have the right kind of emphasis to command your audience to do what you want it to do. So Reagan had been talking in his speech about walls, walls that separate people, walls that need to be opened up. And he gets to this point and he tells Gorbachev what he wants him to do. And by that time he established a relationship with Gorbachev and enough to know that Gorbachev would, would listen to and he would follow what Reagan asserted he should do. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Sometime, go on YouTube and listen to that speech. It wouldn't normally be the way you would say it. You would think he would say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. But he says, tear down this wall. A part of journalistic speaking. That's number two. Number three, the mind grabs hold and remembers. The mind grab holds grabs hold and remembers. What does it remember? It remembers pictures. The more you can illustrate uh, the points that you're trying to make uh, would be the way that your audience is gonna grab hold of it. And one example would be my friend, Arthur Wheelock, who's a recently retired curator of Northern European and Dutch painting at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. So when he talks about a painting, so you have a painting in front of you. Now just think of this as an illustration. He talks about the Dutch economy. He talks about banking. At the time that these paintings, he sets up the entire scene for you of how and why these paintings were done and why they're so durable and why we have them. And, and you know, they travel around the world and they attract thousands and thousands of people who want to go see them. But it's a part of the whole Dutch culture. So what you come away with is an education, not just about specific paintings, but the whole Dutch economy and its place in the geopolitical economy in the world today. So he's painting a picture and he's doing it through visualization and that's how your audience is going to remember this. Number four, collecting and retelling your own stories. So what we have is this recent phenomenon, I say fairly recent, but maybe it's like 20 years now. So we've had 
Oprah is an example, Wayne Dyer, Susie Orman, Deepak Chopra, all of these people basically have come forward to tell their own stories. So Oprah is an example of a person, you know that she had a good outcome. Yes, she was sexually abused. Yes, she had, she went through all of these trials and tribulations herself. She was the first person to really tell everyone, open herself up to the public. So it made the appetite, the precedent for personal storytelling, both about success and about the, the struggles that you, you've been through. Another person, one is Brene Brown. I don't know if you've listened to these people, either on podcasts or in other broadcast platforms, but they're very open to telling their own story. So to go back to this point, you could say, well, Jim, you had these interesting stories to tell. Every single human being has a life story to tell. Either you open that up and you tell your own story, uh, retelling your own story as a, an object lesson, a point that you want to make. And this is, this is a very popular way of speaking, but it's a very val valid one as well. But point five, the point that follows that is telling the stories of others. So again, you might say, well, sure, that's interesting for Oprah. She had this very interesting and, and struggled so much in her background and she was willing to talk about it. You can tell stories and you don't even have to tell stories about your own life. Uh, you might, you might think you don't have stories to tell. You can tell the stories of other people. So when I was growing up, my family had a subscription to what was called Reader's Digest. I, I think it still exists, but I'm not sure. And one of the most well-read uh, columns for every issue was my most memorable character. And it was a column that told you the story of really, people would write in and say, this is the most interesting person I ever met. I couldn't wait to read those stories. And those stories became my own stories. In fact, I cut them out and I, believe it or not, I still have them in my file of memorable things I love to read. Obituaries are a great thing to read. You had recently, um, well, in Dallas, you had Gerald Hines. You had, you know, when you, whenever you see people, and it doesn't even have to be a notable or historic figure, read obituaries. You know why? You can use them in your speeches. And you can just say, well, interesting about the life of, Gerald Hines, or interesting about the life of this baseball player who just uh, died. Read these stories, why? Because it's really history, but it's personal history. And these are stories that you can claim for yourself. You, you don't, you don't yeah, it's not, you're, you're not, you're just borrowing and retelling someone else's story. That's completely valid. And I, I think this is important. Uh, sometimes I have used the story of a person who, for example, has, uh, escaped a concentration camp or survived a concent concentration camp. There are a lot of dramatic stories of people to tell that aren't your, aren't your own stories. It's fine. Six point, fictionalized stories. So uh, very often on TED Talks you'll see uh, or other people will use fictionalized stories. So you can say, and it's perfectly fine if you stretch the truth a little bit, you can say, well, as my daughter told me last night when she was, I was struggling with her to get her to eat her dinner, she said, no, mom, I'm not gonna eat that because blah, 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 blah. Okay, so you see where I'm going with this? You can make up your own story and it's what the audience is going to cling to. It's what they're gonna hold on to. And I'm gonna tell you one thing that's an absolute guarantee. When the person who's in your audience goes home and someone asks them or goes back to the office or let's say in this case is having some kind of a conversation where they're going to say, hey, what did that person talk about? You're not going to be able to tell them, oh, well, there were six points and blah, 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 blah. No, what are you going to tell them? You're going to tell them the stories they told, even if they were made up stories. Uh, the last point, employing stories as metaphors to support a point. So I have a friend who escaped from Hungary in the 1956 uh, Soviet uprising and occupation. She walked through fields in her bare feet. She got to a railroad, an empty uh, uh, train uh, car that was going on the tracks, was gonna take off on the tracks. She jumped on that and she escaped. She got to Canada. Her whole life story was amazing. She was a kid, she was six years old. She's, she's running to catch this train. Her feet are bleeding. She has no shoes on. That's how she escaped um, Soviet, the Soviet occupation. She has an incredible story to tell. So I always think of using her story 
to support and encourage people who are suffering uh, or making a leap to freedom? How do we gain this kind of freedom to, to be able to live in the way that she ultimately lived? So again, this is the first, first point we're talking about storytelling. I've given you seven keys, the historic origins, the journalistic style of speaking, the mind grabs hold and remembers, the collecting and retelling your own stories, the stories of others, fictionalized stories, and employing uh, st stories as metaphors to make a point. Second section here, I'm gonna race through this, building a bridge to your audience. Now, this is absolutely critically important and a lot of people don't get this at all. So, the building a bridge is the only way that you can communicate effectively to an audience and have your words conveyed to the minds and hearts and souls of the audience and for them to be communicating back and forth. Now, the first thing you have to understand is that nonverbal communication is the only way to, uh, to understand it uh, you have to see that Do Dr. Uh, Moravian, for example, in 1971, he did a big study. It's called Silent Messages. Now, most communication, he thought he ranked it at 75%. I say it's a little bit less than that, but we have to understand that most communication is nonverbal. So it's when you go out to um, an audience and you know that you have to build a bridge to them, you have to recognize that what you're saying verbally is preceded by what you're saying in your heart and in your consciousness. So real communication is the connection of my consciousness with another person's consciousness. And you have to understand that this, you, uh, to see a oneness of this, be, of the speaker and the audience is critically important. You are not separate from your audience. You are together. And if you go out on stage and you understand that this is really where communication takes place, you're going to advance your purpose and your outcome in speaking uh, by in, in exponentially. So what happens is that there is in front of you, uh, and this is the, they're getting to the second point here, that there is something called bringing down the fourth wall. Now who knows what a fourth wall is? Anyone know what a fourth wall is? So if you're an actor or a performer on stage, you usually, typically, you have a wall behind, you have a wall to the right, you have a wall to the left. What's the wall in front of you? That's the fourth wall. That's the fourth wall of division. So when you go out as a speaker or you go out as a musical performer or a singer or an actor, the audience sitting there is can be skeptical nervous fearful distracted bored sleepy you get a, you get an audience full of people that a lot of times and i know i felt this way myself like why am i here why i don't this is not going to be good it's a waste of my time i you know i, I don't know whether this performance is really going to be worth my being here the that is the wall of resistance to what you you have a job to do. You have a job to do. You, your purpose in being there is to commit a valuable message to the hearts, minds, and souls of those people in the audience. So how do you bring down that wall? How, how, how do you bring that down? How do you uh, deal with that automatic wall of resistance? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a story. One night, I was taking Nancy Reagan to a drug abuse center in uh, the panhandle of Florida. And it was a program where the students were learning, it was graduation night, and they were learning whether they were, had, had uh, successfully completed the program and were, were clean and could go back and live with their parents or their grandparents. So you had the parents and the grandparents and, and other people, you know, sitting on one side, you had the kids on the other side, and this went on for hours. And they would run together in the middle of the room and there was everyone was sobbing. I mean, I'll tell you, the Secret Service with us, they were crying and Secret Service is not allowed to cry. Secret Service is crying. The White House uh, uh, press corps, there was a company, else, they were crying. I mean, the media never cries, right? So I'm sitting next to Nancy Reagan and she had prepared remarks, uh, typed out blue ink on these big uh, five by seven index cards. We knew that that was not gonna work. 
After hours of sitting there and all this emotion, she could not get up and give a canned speech. So we tore those up. She gets a microphone thrown in her face and she goes to the center of the gymnasium and she turns to the parents. She said, I have to talk to you first. And I have to tell you, I understand. There's no hurt like the hurt a parent can suffer when they discover that their kids are on drugs or selling drugs or they've been arrested. And she just talks like this and she says, I want to tell you how much I love you, how much I support you, blah, blah, blah. Turns to the kids. She does the same thing. She tells them how much she loves them. She says, you have a great life ahead of you. Don't ruin it through this, blah, blah, blah. I'm here for you, blah, blah, blah. At the end of this, she's carried out on the shoulders of these kids. She's carried out on their shoulders. The Secret Service, again, they were going nuts, right? So on, on the, in the motorcade, on the way back to our hotel at night, it was exhausting and I said to her, this reminds me of a little saying that I have that I like. It says, whenever the heart speaks, no matter how simple the words, they're always acceptable to those who have hearts. And I said, that's what you did tonight. That was an example of bringing down the fourth wall. If you approach your audience with love, with sincerity, with interest, with care and consideration, the wall will be dissolved. That you have to show the interest in your audience. And I'm gonna give you another example of that uh, just before we wrap up here. Uh, third point, you need to be fully briefed. You need to do research on your audience. You have to know who they are. You have to, in, in a certain sense. So one night, for example, I was speaking at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and I thought I was gonna be speaking to college students. So I prepared my remarks that way. I get up, the audience, my gosh, the audience was filling up, standing room only. But when I look out at them, they were all senior citizens. And I didn't, I didn't take into account the fact that a lot of senior citizens like to live in university communities. So it was packed with senior citizens. So I had to adjust what I was saying away from some of the more nuances that I was gonna use and stories I was gonna use that if I was speaking to college students. So I had to adjust. So you see what I'm talking about? Bringing down that wall requires an education and a briefing and knowledge about who it is you're really speaking to. Uh, the fourth point, you look where you look and, and your body language and your voice pitch, what that conveys uh, to an audience. So it's important that you are aware of how you're speaking and how you might be heard. Because again, it's not just the words that are reaching your audience, it's the feeling in your heart. How many of you have experience that I have, you, you, listen, you go to listen to a person speaking and quite frankly, you have the feeling they don't care whether they're there or not. And they think it's, a, the speaker thinks it's a waste of their time. That gets conveyed to the audience. That's something you have to take into consideration as well. The fifth, fifth point, are you speaking what your audience really wants to hear? You need to ask that question. Uh, so often you'll get a speaker who'll be talking about, let's say World War II history, and all, all you, you came to hear something uh, completely different. So you need to make sure that your message is matched up with what your audience wants to hear. And I, I give you an example of going back to the, uh, the Brandenburg Wall speech. Before, and of course, presidents can do this because they have a staff to do it. But here's an example. So Peter Robinson, who was doing, he was the main speech writer for that speech, went to East Berlin in advance of our trip to Berlin, which was really to celebrate the 700th birthday of that old city, Berlin. And he talks to people in East Berlin and he says, what if the US president comes here to the wall to speak? What, what would you like to hear him speak about? Well, we'd like to hear him come here and say, tear down this wall. Really? Okay, so Peter Robinson goes back to the Oval Office. He tells the president, the president loves the idea of going to do what he ultimately did. But every time the speech draft went through the head of the Defense Department, Secretary of State, NSC, that was always crossed out. They thought it was too inflammatory. So Reagan gets to the Berlin Wall, to the Brandenburg Gate, and he says to his personal aide, the boys at the State Department aren't gonna like this. So when he gets up there, he 
goes back to what? He goes back to what people ask him to do. So again, bringing down the fourth wall, matching up what you're saying with what the audience really wants or needs to hear. Okay, last two points. What is what you say, what is being heard? Now, if you haven't focused on anything I've said this afternoon, think about this for a minute because it's the biggest mistake that we make. You may say to your, your little son or daughter, or something like that, um, you need to go to bed. They might hear, well, you need to go to bed before midnight. They might be processing it away. Well, you need to go to bed sometime. What you say is not necessarily what is heard. So when I was negotiating with the Chinese, for example, we stayed for days and days and days negotiating with the Chinese and all we got back was no, 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 no. Was what we were saying heard the way we thought we were saying it? You have to really think about this because I would say probably a majority of all the things that we talk about, either in a conversation or a speech, whether it's casual or more formal, will suffer from the fact that we don't realize how people are actually hearing or taking what we're saying. And we have to have more, more self-knowledge about that. In the case of the Chinese, we, stood, we stayed there for uh, probably 10 days eating exotic Chinese food like sea slugs and monkey heads and all that sort of thing. Finally, we said, we're not getting anywhere. We got on our Air Force plane and we flew back to Washington. We get into the situation room and we thought it was gonna be a national controversy that we failed in our negotiation. We get in there, they're applauding us and they say, we're, and we say, why are you applauding us? And they say, because you won. While you were flying back, the Chinese agreed to everything you asked for. Now, were, were they hearing it the way, because of cultural distinctions, the way we were speaking it? Last point. And that is to say, again, this is all about building a bridge to your audience. And if you don't build that bridge, your voice is not, has nothing to carry it or to convey it to that audience. And there's no, it's not a two-way street. You must build a bridge to your audience. And this is the last point. You need to have closure in a way that your audience feels that you've really been joined together. One time on the South Lawn, we had uh, Mary Martin, who was a famous uh, screen and, and um, you know, film and, and uh, Broadway actress, Mary Martin. And so I said to her, how is it that you are so well loved by your audience? And she threw her arms around me, which was great, right? And she said, Jim, she said, I'm from Texas. And she said, I was born loving people and they loved me back. So think about this, loving your audience is the best way to build a bridge over which your message can be conveyed and heard and the response come back to you. And just to wrap this up, the, the other person who's also an entertainer who did this so well, I don't know if you've ever watched any reruns, but they're worth watching them, The Carol Burnett Show, which is this absolutely hysterical comedy, right? So at the end of her show, and she ran for, I think it was like seven years straight, at the end of her show, she always sang a little song, and it had these words in it. It's been so nice to be together. That's how you need to think about your speaking and your audience, that you are together. You're not separate, you're one. You're all listening to ideas that have value, ideas that can benefit the audience. This is a part of building that bridge, conveying your message. Again, these seven points in this section, building a bridge, nonverbal communication, is, is critical to know, consciousness to consciousness. Second, bringing down the fourth wall. Third, uh, being fully briefed. Four, your look, your voice, your pitch, your pitch of your voice and your body language. Five, what your audience wants to hear. What do they wanna hear? Make sure you're aligned with that. Six, is what you say, what is being heard. And seven, 
It's so nice to be together. And I'll say that to you. It's been really nice to be together with you. I can see some very nice faces there. Thank you for sharing that with me. And I'm going to stop now. This is my promise. I think we got through 40 minutes here. I think we have maybe five minutes. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And um, do, you, do they know how to submit their questions? Yeah, we're getting him in now. So Okay, we're great. Good. Thank you. So, You've been a great audience. You haven't been very noisy or... We're, we're, we're well behaved. Thank you. <laughs> no. Well, thank you, James, so much for all of that. Um, with all those lessons that you've taught us, um, it's a wealth of knowledge that you've attained through the years, um, which will go into our first question. Um, from our audience, uh, was, of course, you know, our group is definitely interested in in your past as well as your your working your work with Ronald Reagan. So I do have a, a question here from uh, Ronnie. Um, you work directly with one of the best communicators in American history. Reagan was an incredible speaker who often could connect with all Americans regardless of political affiliation. Obviously, he had a lot of natural skill, but also how would he rehearse before a big speech and how would you recommend to someone else? Uh, how would you recommend someone else rehearses in advance? Um, yeah. Thank you for asking that. And thank you for saying those nice, nice things about Reagan, which is absolutely true. So Reagan, I want to take you back to uh, his college, uh, Eureka College, a small, small liberal arts college, which is barely holding on today, hanging on today in uh, Illinois. And his very first speech, he actually gets up in front of the whole student body and he says he wants them to join him in demanding that the president of the college gets fired. I mean, this is very unlike what you think Ronald Reagan would be speaking about, right? So he says, and he writes about this. He said, this I always considered the very best speech I ever gave because for the first time I saw the power of my words deployed for a specific result. People cheer at the end of every sentence. Now, I think this gave, and I had the great honor of speaking from the same platform at Eureka College where Reagan had spoken, which was, was a marvelous opportunity, uh, trying to, on my part, live up to the great orator of uh, Ronald Reagan. But this is how he started. And he knew from that point on that two things, he had to be rehearsed, but he was a person who by the time he got to Washington knew what he believed in. And if you read my last book called True Reagan, you'll see that Reagan always spoke from his heart and he always talked and even repetitively, he was bl blasted by the media. Why Reagan says the same thing over and over and over again. Well, Reagan became an evangelist for freedom around the world. He was a freedom fighter. So he knew, first of all, what he believed in. So you, it's, it's very, his, his speaking is very durable. You could rely on Reagan basically to be saying the same things over and over again. So it was something that he knew he, he wanted to be very comfortable with. But if he's introducing a new policy or a new program of some kind with a new idea, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And I can't emphasize that enough. Because people will say, well, you know, they'll either wing it or they're going to read a speech, which I, I'm not entirely opposed to. Some people can read a speech as if it's not being written. If it's, if it's written in, in, the, in the most uh, conversational way. So rehearsing is very important. And yes, Reagan did it. And lastly, let me tell you, if a speech was obviously drafted for him, even if it's on a teleprompter, he made, and I've, I've got examples I could show you of speeches, uh, speech copies, he wrote all over it and he underlined for emphasis things that he wanted to bring out. So even the greatest speaker among us made notes on his speech document and underlined things that he wanted to emphasize, that sort of thing. So you can do this as well. Thank you, Mr. Rosebush. Um, a lot of good questions here, but let's see if we can squeeze a couple in here. Um, on that note of uh, President Reagan being um, at such a high lofty position, but um, you also know that how he's able to kind of bring himself down and connect with the people to bridge that gap, so to say. Um, I do have a question from, um, from uh, Sonny here. 
who asks, who says, thanks for the great presentation. How do you balance uh, being an authoritative, how do you balance, what do you, how to balance being an authoritative figure versus being a humble figure? What an excellent question. That, that's really, well, I'd have to say, doesn't power emanate from humility? I think that most powerful speakers are not people who are arrogant and, and telling you, well, this is the way it's going to be. But remember the thing I said about the unconscious, nonverbal communication? So Reagan was certainly without question the most egoless person I have ever met in my life. Now, even aside from let's, politicians, most politicians have egos. And it, it's a part of selling themselves. Reagan left the White House the exact same person who entered the front door the very first day. It power meant nothing to him at all. It didn't change him at all. And that's one of the reasons that he was believed when he stood up to speak or when he, for example, in his, to me, I, and I think it's been ranked by John Meacham just this past week as one of the top five, uh, top five or top 10 speeches in history, his uh, speech that he, the last speech he gave from the Oval Office. And remember, this is what he said. He said, I've often spoken about the shining city on a hill. And I don't think I've ever really explained what I meant when I said it. Follow this? He's just drawing you in, right? Because why? You want to hear what his thinking is about why did he always talk about the shining city on a hill? And then he explains it about how important America is to the rest of the world and that if a, the light of American exceptionalism grows dim, the rest of the world will fall into chaos. And he, he explains why this is important to him. So you're drawn in. So I think to answer your question, he has no ego and the audience recognizes that. I mean, I was with Reagan, for example, one time in Dorchester, Massachusetts, we go into a bar, working class people all around, you wouldn't call them uh, necessarily conservatives or Republicans, whatever. They couldn't wait to get hang out with him. Same thing when we went to Ireland to the to the local community where his family grew up. Oh, the bar was jammed with people wanting to have a pint with him because they considered him one of them. One of them. That's how he did it. Great. Now I know we're we're taking a lot of time here for you uh, from you, uh, James. But um, let's do one final question, and especially. Oh, you know I could talk about this forever. So. <laughs> I bet. Um, but um, let's see. We do have. Uh, let's go one final question here. Um, what do you feel is the biggest challenge for a student today, or one of the young professional or a student today, to be heard? Um, and also maybe today as well uh, in. in um, in context of our new uh, changing world uh, with the Zoom and less of the interactive things. What are these challenges um, that student, that you see that students or, or people emerging in, this, in their careers or switching careers in this new age um, go through and how we can accomplish that? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a good one and it's a complicated one because as I talk about in my book, and, I, and I, again, I hope you all will get this and, and uh, enjoy that, but. Um, there's a lot of noise today and there are a lot of words and there's a high threshold for communication today simply because the world is overcrowded with too many people talking so much anger so much confusion so much you know people trying to get their position across and heard how does how does a young person a young professional get their message across I think, I think it's extremely challenging. Um, I, I think that if you want to be heard, the first thing I would do is I would have a durable message that people want to hear. And it could be just about your career. If you want to get someone to, to know more about what you think and, and what you do, uh, which is a very valid use for communication, I think you need to develop something about which is totally unique to you. So what you need to do is you need to start with a strong sense of identity. What is it that you believe in and why do you believe in it? Who are you? Knowing yourself is the beginning. Self-knowledge is the beginning of everything. So the first thing I would say 
is don't communicate other people's ideas. Communicate what's in your heart. Remember that Nancy Reagan story. If she had gotten up there and given a speech that someone else had written for her, that would not have worked at all. She had to speak what was in her heart. Now, what is in our heart is something we can always share. And it might not always be taken or heard in the way that it's meant. Self-knowledge, understanding your audience. If you're trying to be heard by potential employers or uh, if you're trying to get into a school or whatever you're, whatever you're trying to do to advance your own careers, self-knowledge is the most important thing you can gain. Who am I and what is my mission in the world today? What is my mission in my community? What is my mission with my family? What is my mission with my job? What is my mission with the job that I want? To understand that and answer those questions, it's not easy, but it's critically important to you gaining that position and to gaining an audience for your message. Then I think you have to ask yourself, how can I articulate what my beliefs are, what I'm thinking, what I can contribute? Ask yourself this question, what can I contribute to this community, to this family, to this house, to this job, to this company, to this school? What can I contribute? Not so much what can I take away from it, but what can I give to it? That will help and inform what your language, your articulation, your message, and your mission should be. I guarantee you, if you follow that and you really dig into it, then you're going to be heard in the way that's going to be constructive, valuable, and useful for you in your careers. Mr. Rosebush, thank you so much for that today. Um, the lessons that we've learned today have been more than invaluable for, for us going forward, uh, no matter what stage we're at. And uh, we can't thank you enough for taking your time today and providing this master class for us here. And a reminder for everyone out there, to purchase his book, which is once again a number one bestseller, a bestseller on Amazon, Winning Your Audience. Um, it's available on Amazon and any online retailers uh, you may find. And don't forget to visit growthstrategy.us and impactspeakercoach.com to find out more about how James can help you and your organization succeed. Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and thank you again, Mr. Rosebush, for joining us at the council. We love having you around, and we love to have you um, when our uh, programs come back to uh, in-person events. Uh, we can't wait for you to come back to Houston. Can't wait. I love that. Love being with all of you today. Wonderful. Thank you thank again, you, James. everyone. Yep. Have a wonderful day, and please uh, stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you all.